with Georgos Petropoulos. I'm research fellow here at Bruegel, and I would like to welcome you in this event on uh, civil society for the digital age. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Glenn Whale, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, and also uh, teaching faculty at Princeton University with us. He just arrived this morning, and he has uh, a tough uh, day, so we are happy to have him uh, here. And um, I'm also happy to have uh, some uh, great experts uh, to discuss what uh, Glenn will present. The presentation will focus on uh, um, uh, a paper that uh, uh, Glenn has co-authored uh, uh, on the civil society and on uh, how uh, data markets of the future should be organized. And uh, the underlying idea is uh, one chapter of his book, uh, authored book, Radical Markets, uh, which is um, uh, basically um, supports the idea to treat uh, data as a, la a labor and not as a capital. Uh, so uh, the panel discussion uh, in alphabetical order, we have uh, Elin Sivot, who is a senior policy analyst at uh, ITIF Center of Data Innovation. Welcome, Elin. We have Orla Linsky, assistant professor on London School of Economics, uh, a privacy and competition law expert. Uh, Bertin Martens, senior economist and team leader for the Digital Economy Research Program at the European Commission, the Joint Re Research Center, with uh, a long experience in research in digital economy. And we have uh, also uh, Thibaut Weber, confederal uh, secretary at uh, the Labour Union ETUC, and also member of uh, the expert group of the Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, so, um, as for the structure, uh, we'll start with Glenn's presentation, who will present us the paper and uh, the ideas which I believe uh, will be will motivate a great discussion. Uh, and then we'll have initial uh, comments by the panel speakers. Uh, some discussion will open the floor for questions. So, Glenn, uh, thanks, and the floor is yours. Uh, great. So. Um, this uh, doesn't have exactly the title that was advertised, nor exactly the title of the paper, um, but it's all sort of in the same vicinity. Um, this is joint work with uh, Jaron Lanier, who's uh, also at Microsoft and is a very interesting person if you don't know about him, but also uh, draws a lot on some work I've been doing with uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, who's the founder of Ethereum, and Zoe Hitzig. So um, I wrote this book, Radical Markets, um, that I was just presenting at KU Leuven uh, um, about. And the book tries to uh, sort of revive and update for the digital era a political philosophy um, that we call la liberal radicalism. So, so uh, this is a tradition that I would associate with people like uh, the Marquis de Condorcet, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, Henry George, Beatrice Webb, uh, uh, George Clemenceau, Hannah Arendt. And uh, the basic concept of this political tradition is on the one hand, so the, the, the idea of the book is to try to address um, a current crisis of growing inequality, populism, increasing authoritarian attitudes, a focus on uh, the concentration of power in a few tech giants, um, and to sort of provide some sort of a framework for groups that are trying to reestablish some, or defend or extend some notion of a, a liberal society in this context. So what do I mean by liberal radicalism? So First, liberalism, how do I understand that? To me, liberalism is, there's different ways to express it. One, day, uh, one way is the idea of a market. Another way is, uh, probably my favorite way, is the opposition to hierarchical, historically derived, and arbitrary authority. But other ways of talking about it, a term that's used a lot in the digital economy, is decentralization, uh, or neutrality across different ways of living or the notion of uh, the combination of equality and diversity. So okay, on the one hand, there's liberalism. Um, but the problem is that 
many attempts to instantiate these liberal ideas have run into various paradoxes that have been pointed out by radical uh, thinkers. So for example, um, society is not individualistic fundamentally. Like what makes civilization work is economies of scale that we can all achieve more together than we can achieve on our own. Um, and there's some challenges of that that poses for liberalism. Another is that property is not just a commodity. Most land is not identical to every other land. Um, so that creates some challenges for liberal thinking. Um, there are often persistent minorities within liberal societies. And that also creates issues. There are ways in which language that we use to communicate with each other can create itself oppression. And that creates paradoxes for thinking about free speech. And there's a natural tendency of capital to be much more concentrated than labor. And that can also create problems. So what are the paradoxes that those creates? Well, if, you, if there are economies of scale, if society requires organization, if we're not all just isolated individuals, then in fact, attempts to um, build liberal institutions on an individualistic basis, paradoxically, end up allowing the individual to be oppressed by uh, organized forces. Um, so if you don't explicitly recognize the need for collective organization, you can actually en end up undermining liberalism, even though it sounds like an individualistic idea. Um, democracy, which might sound like some sort of a solution to that, a way to have individuals have collective organization, can end up oppressing minorities and therefore may not be as great of a solution to uh, this problem as you might think. Uh, you might think that having just free labor, ending slavery, whatever, would lead to symmetrical labor relations, but if capital is far more concentrated than labor is, uh, that may actually just end up leading to wage slavery. Um, if property is not, in fact, identical, if it's not competitive, then, in fact, property rights, which are meant to protect the individual, can be the source of monopoly power, which actually leads to oppression and to waste. So there are many of these paradoxes which many traditional forms of liberalism, liberal individualism, ends up facing. So the key idea between, behind liberal radicalism is to say, OK, rather than view these as pesky little things we need to get around, let's actually embrace and take as fundamental to the theory the fact that there are all these things that are true of social life. But nonetheless, let's see whether in the face of those, we can build liberal social institutions that take all those things into account. So that's what I mean by liberal radicalism. And the book does this in a number of areas. It proposes a new system of private property, which is meant to be liberal in the face of the fact that property is not a commodity. It builds a new system of voting that is meant to protect minorities. It builds a new system of immigration, et cetera, et cetera. But today I want to focus on something maybe a little bit narrower, which is the digital economy. And in particular, the way in which um, existing digital institutions have wiped away the diversity of collective organization that's necessary for a flourishing liberal society, according to liberal radical ideas, and the way in which uh, new institutions that are starting to come about might help fill the gap and reestablish the sort of diversity of collective institutions that are necessary. OK. So there are a number of different aspects to what I think has become the imbalanced in, the, in digital society. Uh, there are many complaints that people have, and I think they're all related to this. I think there's most broadly a sense that agency has been taken away from relevant individuals and communities that can best serve them and been absorbed into a small number of digital platforms. I was in Norway uh, relatively recently, and the word totalitarianism was just constantly being used by people across the political spectrum to describe the concentration of power. And you see that in the amount of our time. You know, you think about people around the world, maybe about a tenth of their time on average is being effectively managed by a couple of digital platforms. You, you wonder whether anyone's ever quite had that much power over the way in which people live before. Um, so there's issues about a, attention. There's issues about the information that reaches us. I think these are all interrelated, and I'll try to connect them. But 
this project began thinking about data economies and privacy and issues like this. So I want to start by focusing um, there, and then I'll come back to these other issues. And and I think the the real sharp thing about the data economy, I think, is not necessarily that that's the center of our fears, but that this is a pretty sharp way of trying to measure the concentration of power. You know, economics is a way of turning things into numbers. Um, and so I think this is a useful focal point. You know, lots of people are concerned about what's going to happen to the labor market, the way in which automation um, and digitization may potentially undermine uh, the position of workers, you know, quote, take our jobs. But I don't think most economists really think jobs are going to disappear as much as that the share of national income going to labor is declining. So national income used to be about 70% to labor, and it's fallen to about 60% over the course of the last 40 years. And um, that is plausibly quite related to what's going on in the digital economy. Because if you look at the labor share associated with the largest tech platforms, it's about um, 10 to 15%. Whereas the labor share in most of the economy has traditionally been 70% and is now 60%. So it's quite plausible that an important part of this shift has to do with what's going on within the digital economy. And that if the economy continues to become more intelligent, artificially intelligent, that this may end up leading to an overall decline in, in the share of labor uh, to quite low levels, potentially, that, that may be worrying. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, I, it's not so clear that this automation and the way that the compact and the digital economy works where we give our data away for free in exchange for the services that we receive is actually producing the most productive artificial intelligence. So the model here tends to be that we make sort of a deliberate point of not making people aware of the way in which they're contributing value. So I'm sure many people have done these recaptchas. Uh, you know, you en enter uh, words in order to do it. I, I don't know how many people realize that you're actually training machine learning algorithms when you're doing that. That's the whole point of the recaptcha system, right? Um, and uh, there's a nice cartoon capturing this, which says, to complete your registration, please tell us whether or not this image contains a stop sign, yes or no. Answer quickly, our self-driving car is almost at the intersection. So much of AI is just figuring out ways to offload work onto random strangers. Um, and I think that uh, the weirdness of this and sort of the inefficiency of this system was well captured by an internal imagination video that Google had, where they thought that maybe in the future Google should think of your data rather than you as its customer. And that what they would do is if they wanted to find out your weight, Rather than asking you for your uh, weight, they would design, based on their knowledge of your preferences, a scale, you know, a measuring scale that would be irresistible for you to buy, put it on Amazon, and embed into it a Google tracker. And that this would, um, like, give them your weight. But you think about how inefficient that is. I mean, most people know their weight. Like, why would you manufacture a s scale try to trick someone into buying it just so you can measure their weight. It's like, it's not just that it's creepy and, and bizarre, but it's totally inefficient. Like, it's a contortion that we go through just to avoid making people aware of the role that they're actually playing in, in the system. It's actually a bit like when Thomas Edison first uh, invented what became movie uh, technology, he had a patent on just videotaping people on the street and selling that as movies. And he said, this is artificial you know, acting. We don't need actors anymore. And you know, all the rents would just go to the people who own the cameras. And then actually a French innovator realized we could do recorded theater, where we would actually pay people and they would get credits and there would be a union representing them and whatever. And you got much better quality stuff that way because people were agents and they were included in the process and they were actually able to contribute to it. 
Um, so we argue that many of these problems result from thinking of data as capital to just be picked up by any company that's able to scoop it up and not as labor, uh, intimately tied to people in need of collective protection, et cetera. So let me, rather than giving a definition of those, try to give you a series of contrasts. So in the data as capital perspective, data is viewed as exhaust to be picked up by whoever is smart enough to make it useful. Whereas in the data as labor perspective, data is created by user actions. And so the fruits of it belong first to the individual contributors. In the data as capital perspective, AI is viewed as being driven mostly by algorithms, computational power, and brilliant programmers. Whereas in the data as labor perspective, AI is really the collective intelligence um, of ordinary people uh, who are contributing to it. Um, in, in data's capital perspective, AI is expected to flourish if there are big payoffs to entrepreneurs and innovators, whereas in the data's labor perspective, AI is expected to flourish if individual contributors who make it possible have a real economic stake in the outcomes. In the data's capital perspective, AI is expected to displace workers, and so therefore we're going to have to either give them a universal basic income, um, or they'll have to work in areas unaffected by the digital economy. Whereas in data's labor, actually, um, AI is raising the productivity of individuals who are now able to spread their data contributions more broadly, and therefore it should tend to lead, actually, to increase in the value that individuals are contributing to the digital economy. In the data's capital perspective, people are you know, expected to be displaced and useless, and so they should just get over themselves and find meaning in areas of their lives other than their you know, productivity. Whereas in data's labor, data is, act, um, is actually expected to support a notion of meaning and digital dignity. And in the data's capital perspective, the notion is that individuals are perfectly happy with giving away their information in exchange for the free stuff that they get. Um, whereas in the data's labor perspective, individuals are thought on their own to have very little bargaining power in the face of digital monopolies, and they require some form of collective organization competition or unions, uh, which I'll emphasize in a moment, to protect them. Okay, so in particular, what do I mean by these unions? Well, the notion is that we would have collective organizations uh, representing our interests and in our data that would basically serve three types of roles. For, first of all, they would be collective bargainers. Second, they would be guarantors of quality of the information that emanates from them. And third, they would help guide people's attention and manage what they spend their time on on behalf of those individuals. And you know, you can think of these as being unions. That's how I personally like to most think of them. But there are other organizations that are not unions that are like this. Insurance companies have some similar roles. Universities have some similar roles. Professional associations. And, in, uh, and copyright collection agencies all have some similar uh, roles to these. And we describe them by a series of characteristics that we think that they need to have. So first of all, um, we argue that these organizations need to be fiduciaries in the sense that they uh, are exclusively representing the interests of the people they serve in three senses. First, they need to be have a legal fiduciary duty that can be enforced legally. Second, they need to be paid in a way that's consistent with their mission. So if they're just being paid, for example, based on the data that they're selling and just taking a percent fee, that's not really going to work because then they're just going to have an incentive to sell as much data as they can. And that's not the actual interests of the users, which are a balance between the wages they receive and the protection of their rights to privacy and limitations on the use of their data and so forth. And third, um, they need to be what we would call structural fiduciaries in the sense that they can't have too many masters that they're supposed to be serving. They need to have a set of people that they're bargaining in favor of that have a relatively homogeneous set of interests in order to allow them to serve this role. Third, um, they need to be enforcers of quality standards. And there are several different aspects to this. One way you can think about this is that you know, a lot of, quote, fake news came out of various types of organizations. But many of these were actually just individuals or small groups of people who were operating in the system. 
And because of the lack of filtering and reputation mechanisms, a lot of this stuff got out there and propagated. And we don't believe that the state or large platforms should serve this role. We think that this role of quality filtering naturally belongs in intermediate sized organizations. Um, but this isn't just for news and things like this. There's all sorts of information quality we care about. Everything from the quality of films and creative production, and you think of the role that Hulu and Netflix have played in really bringing about this peak TV. So that's one role. And another role is the quality of things that you might consider more passive or micro data, like identifying objects in, in, a, um, in a photograph. A third role is what we call inalienable provenance. So this is the notion that um, there are uh, crucial to the idea of labor is that labor is not a commodity which can just be sold and resold and whatever. We don't allow people to sell themselves into slavery. You are allowed to sell fruits of your labor and the use of your labor for specific limited purposes, but you can't just sell yourself away. And if your data are the digital representation of you, it should also be the case that you can never really sell your data. Now that sounds like a paradox. What do I mean by you can't sell your data? I thought I was talking about data markets. But this is where I really differ from those that talk about data as property. Data as labor has to mean that you sell some use of your data in an appropriately cordoned off way, but you never actually sell the data itself. So the, what does that mean? Well, in practice, in the present moment, it probably has to mean exercising GDPR rights to delete your data after it's been used to train some model, et cetera. But um, eventually, there are potential ways to do this using cryptography. So there's something called secure multi-party computation and differential privacy, where you can actually use your data to train some model but the person never actually gets access to the data to begin with. So like one way you could do that, for example, is if you're just trying to compute the average of a number, I can choose a random number, and then I can pass that around and everyone can add their number to it and it can come back to me and I can subtract the random number. I never learned any of the individual numbers and yet I learned the average that way. So there are principles like that that can be used to protect the data itself while still allowing models to train on that data. And similarly, uh, for things where that can't be done, we believe the data needs to maintain a stamp on it that travels with it everywhere and that allows royalties associated with that value when they can't be separated in that clear way to accrue back to the individual, um, as in pre-digital uh, times happened with these Chinese um, works of arts where they would actually, every person who, who owned it would stamp it. So you could tell the full uh, provenance associated with it. And there are new ways of doing this uh, in the digital era using multi-way links. Okay. Um, third, we argue that these organizations, and, and by the way, the point here is that your mid, your fiduciary, would be the repository where your data lives and cannot be sold outside of some, to someone who's not a fiduciary like that for you. Third, we argue uh, for what we call rent sharing, the notion that these organizations need to be strong enough that they can collectively bargain and get a significant share of the rent away from the current platforms, but they need to be small enough or agile enough or competitive enough that they themselves don't end up absorbing most of that rent. So they actually have to be an efficacious basis for pushing those rents back to the individual contributors. Uh, next, we argue that these organizations need to be sufficiently sort of, again, organized and competent that they are able to be repositories of confidential secrets that companies share with them that allow them to bargain on the basis of symmetrical information with the firms that they're addressing. Uh, uh, an overall disorganized, scattered blockchain organization is not going to be able to be something that Google can share its proprietary models with so that it understands how the data is being used. Labor unions played that role. 
Labor unions actually shared secrets with the companies so that it could be the basis of the bargaining. So you need to have a similar level of sort of competence and um, confidentiality that these organizations can achieve. Next, we argue these organizations need to achieve what we call biological realism. They need to be geared in such a way that they can um, accommodate the fact that they actually employ human or man uh, represent human beings. They need to deal with the fact that people have children and time off and they get sick and they have a life cycle and so forth. So there, that needs to be built into the model of the income that comes in through this process. Next, they need to have what we call cognitive realism, which is that the whole point of having an organization like this is that people can't completely manage their attention and their choices online and all the decisions themselves. That's why these platforms have ended up absorbing so much power. But not all of that has to be managed by the platform as a whole or by the isolated individual. Ideally, it would be managed by different sorts of collective organizations at a smaller level that can meaningfully help people make choices, but at the same time that individuals can meaningfully make choices over. And if that sounds like a paradox, just compare the way in which the app market on smartphones works as compared to the social networking market or the search market. In the latter two, you have a couple of monolithic platforms that are controlling most of people's attentions. In the app market, on the other hand, actually your attention is fragmented among many different organizations. It's not so fragmented that you can't manage your attention at all, but it's fragmented enough that not all of your attention is controlled by a few monolithic organizations and you have some real effective choice over what you want to be using. Um, and we argue that these organizations need to last long enough that they can build up real reputation and not just be like a fly-by-night uh, ICO. Now, I focused on the economic aspect of this. But I actually think that this has just as much to say about attention management and about um, news quality as it does about the others. If you think about attention management, we can't have the choices being made just by a giant platform or even by a government. These are very intimate choices. And they're things that people, on the other hand, can't manage their own, on their own. They can't manage your own attention because otherwise you wouldn't need to be managing your own attention, right? I mean, that's like attention, managing attention costs attention. So you need collective organizations to help you uh, do this. But on the other hand, it, you can't put so much power into the hands of a few platforms. It's, totalitarian, as they mentioned. And there are a lot of opportunities to actually use that process in conjunction with the data's labor paradigm to actually help people be more productive, to guide their time to things that actually benefit them and away from things that benefit advertisers. And a tiny example of that actually is Duolingo, something I use a lot. I'm learning German right now. It's a great way that rather than getting absorbed on social media, you can actually do something productive in those spare moments. And I think there's lots of data's labor tasks that m many people could do as well, even native to their social media experiences. Um, similarly, we've been put by the existing digital economy where there are these giant platforms and these isolated individuals into this position of either we put the government in charge of managing information quality or we put these giant global platforms in charge of it. And both of those are incredibly unsatisfactory. They really deny agency to individuals and communities. What we used to have is something where there would be newspapers and they would have their reputation and there would be a re reasonable selection among them. And then there would be newsstands which would choose and you could go to this newsstand or you could go to that newsstand and they would have their reputations as well. And the interactions between these intermediate sized organizations would produce quality. And that's really been taken away by these platforms and it can be rebuilt by things like MIDS. And while this may sound utopian, there's actually been a huge amount of enthusiasm for this. There's been a lot of media interest in this. There's been some skepticism, and I'm sure we'll have a, a good discussion here. But there's lots of larger institutions that are really seriously trying to think about this organization. Angela Merkel gave a talk about a data tax that I really think is in many ways more aligned with our thinking. It's saying that the value needs to be returned to the people who are producing it. And a lot of the largest companies are thinking about this. Microsoft, we've been having lots of discussions. They have Uber. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, many of these folks are really trying, starting to think in this direction. So I think there's some real possibility here. And I'm looking forward uh, to engaging with you all, both in talking about these startups um, and these bigger institutions.
And some of these are quite interesting, actually. So there's a data union that was established in Holland by Paul Tang, a member of the European Parliament. Um, the former chairman of the FCC is creating an organization like this. Um, there's a labor union, data labor union starting up in the United States. So I think it's a very active space. I think there's a lot of activity around it. I think there's a number of problems, according to our principles, with some of these organizations. But it's certainly a super hot space. I think there's probably 100 organizations like this that have started. And I think it's a great basis uh, for our talking. Thank you. Glenn, thanks so much uh, for this presentation, trip to the future, and uh, the very interesting ideas and uh, the model for the future of digital economy you presented. Um, we'll move now to comments by the panel speakers, but before that, allow me two questions. The first one is, um, uh, there are empirical evidence that uh, data exhibits uh, diminishing returns to scale, which means that for a big platform that collects a lot of data, the marginal value of the individual, it's small. Um, so how that, such a model could be sustained of paying the individual for the data will contribute? Would it have been a very trivial uh, amount in the end? And the yeah. second question uh, is, um, we are talking about um, data unions, um, uh, data labor unions, but we have already labor unions uh, in the offline economy. Do you see these principles and characteristics uh, you presented in the offline economy, in the data union, in the labor unions that we have nowadays? If and if not, could, could how could we move? What are the driving forces in digital economy that could lead us there? Great. Uh, so let's respond to that, and then we go to Elin Great. and to the rest of the panelists. Great. So um, I I dispute the characterization that data has decreasing returns to scale. I think that the reason that you get those results is that you look at one very particular task, usually a relatively easy task, and that's true. You will get decreasing returns to scale in that relatively easy task. But the thing is that for sophisticated machine learning tasks, I don't think that that's true. So I think if you're training, like there's lots of machine learning tasks that we haven't even really made any progress on at all, like whole paragraph understanding, uh, for example. There's very little on that, and in that area, most people think the reason is that the data that you need to make any progress on that is very, very large. So that means it has increasing returns to scale up to a level that we have yet to get to. So I think the way that most data works is actually that there is increasing returns to scale until you get to a sort of a critical level that's the sample complexity associated with that task, and then there's decreasing returns to scale beyond that. But if the tasks that are more complex are actually more valuable, which I think is probably true, because we haven't really got an AI that's that useful yet, honestly, then actually I think it might have increasing returns to scale overall once you integrate over all those different tasks. So I, so I, di I dispute that characterization. Um, but of course, you know, it's an empirical question. We have to study it and so forth. Um, there's a lot of characteristics of labor unions offline that are important uh, that we want to copy online, but we want them to be adapted to the digital context. So, for example, there's the idea of a strike. Now, in the offline context, that's a physical thing. In the digital context, it might be done through a VPN that blocks access to the data during some you know, period and that monitors to make sure people don't break that strike. Um, in uh, the offline world, there is solidarity formed by people working in the same physical space. Here, there might be solidarity that starts to form through a social network or through revealing connections that exist in terms of who's training the same algorithm that are currently hidden. So there are, there are things that are related, but they change because of the context changing. Thank you, Glenn. I will pass now to Elin. Uh, so as uh, the ti your title reveals, you work for the Center for Data Innovation. That's so right. it's very relevant to the model presented. So what are your yeah. views? Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very curious to hear the other perspectives across the board, naturally. Um, so, you know, the, the hype right now is about, you know, writing new rules, very complicated rules about data and to treat it as um, a traditional old world finite resource. Uh, I, w I think that is a mistake and I will uh, articulate my point uh, with three arguments. The first one would be that consumers would lose significant value uh, in exchange for minimum direct compensation. The second point would be that the rich would benefit at the detriment of the poor, so you would see inequalities increase. 
And the third one would be that you would see transaction costs per user actually increase, uh, thereby reducing um, consumer value uh, and limiting business opportunities for data for uh, businesses to innovate. Now, much of the proposal that we're discussing today is motivated by the view that um, you know, you're getting really great services by using uh, online applications. Uh, you probably are paying, and you're paying with your data. So after all, you should be getting something in return, right? That's, that's fair. You should get more. And that's very tempting. I mean, if you talk to people in the street and you tell them, for instance, are you in favor of e-privacy, they will likely say yes. But in Europe, we're very well known what that amounts to when we talk about a regulation about e-privacy. Um, so that's a little bit the same problem when you ask them, do you want to be paid for your data? They tend to say yes. Now, let's see how that would work in practice. Um, I came across an estimate um, that says that users would be making a dozen euros a year with their personal data, but that is overstated because it assumes that you would give, distribute all the profits of, let's say, a couple of platforms to um, you distribute it amongst users. A much more realistic estimate would be to look at the combined profits of Google and Facebook, let's say in 2017, about 25 billion euros. And then you would split it equally amongst their monthly average active users, so that's about 4.6 billion. Um, and then how much would you get per year? You would get a whopping 2.7 euros. I don't see how that would get anyone excited. I don't think I will quit my job. Um, so if that is what you call fair compensation, I'd very much like to hear your feedback on that. Um, and what's more is that platforms would have to come up with new business models they would have to compensate because, you know, those smaller amounts of, of, um, of money that you would pay to users, in the end, that would amount to huge, um, to, to a lot of money. So what would they do? They would start charging individuals, half offering them deals, a little bit like Netflix and Amazon Prime uh, are doing with, say, membership fees, um, subscriptions, you know, fee for service. Um, so that would be basically the first point. Um, also, the way industry and users are currently sharing data is mutually beneficial, and whole industries are using the data in ways that um, you know, benefit society as a whole. Um, they do not necessarily hoard that information for competitive advantage. Um, and for rich or for poor, you get equally treated by the platforms, right? So Facebook and Google offer you app, app, applications that are free and relatively easy to use. Um, your system would introduce digital inequality, uh, well, inequality into the digital sphere. Uh, and you're, you're saying, I quote, the free internet isn't really serving the interests of the middle class, much less the poor, but how will a full pay internet improve any of that? I think a full pay internet would, you know, widen the digital divide, not all users would be able to afford it. Uh, and also, let's also mention the digital literacy divide. Not everyone will be able to know which mediators to go to, they don't have access to the same amount of information, how to ensure that they get the best deals to mediators, with mediators. The objective of your system is also to ensure digital dignity, but you value and reward data users based on their net worth. So you're treating individuals as transactional, which is pretty brutal. I think it's an aggressive proposal that basically distorts the basic uh, principle of, of human dignity. And I've, I've actually read the, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, is very much against that kind of system because treating data as a commodity goes very much against uh, humanist values and fundamental rights, which are precisely uh, priceless. Next point, um, I would say I can see how the proposal would increase um, transactional costs that would reduce my value as a user. Um, so it would, if you assign, it's difficult to assign clear data ownership uh, to users um, because of the nature of data, um, because personal data itself is interesting, uh, but it is the aggregation of data, the, the data that is combined that actually um, um, creates those valuable insights. And we're talking about metadata, the information around the main content, so data about the data. Also, if you're talking about monetary transactions, you're talking about multiplying contracts, longer um, or lengthier or more terms and conditions to read. And I personally value my time a little bit more than getting paid to go on Facebook by having read those extra terms and conditions. So for me, that means additional hassle for very little, if any, net benefit. Um, now also, again, 
those proposals fail to acknowledge what online platforms like Facebook, Google really are doing. They're the ones that have created those powerful tools that we get to use every day for free again. Um, if you, let's say you're in your car, uh, you know, the, inter the interesting information is to yourself is uh, your car speed uh, and your localization where you are. Uh, but what makes Waze interesting, for instance, as an application, is to be able to provide real-time information about traffic, which is based on everybody else around you. So, for me, that would be meaning if the exchange of data against free services are um, the ones that satisfy most users, uh, then let it be the, the natural market price. Um, users do have the options uh, the option not to sign up to those platforms. There are alternative platforms, uh, you know, that they can go for uh, if they decide those platforms uh, value their privacy better. Um, so I, I'm sure there will be some reactions to that. Um, and also, in my opinion, businesses have an interest to provide uh, good products and services to their consumers. Why would they risk being accused of unfair data practices? Um, because that would, you know, that would cause reputational damage. Uh, and we have existing legislation in Europe uh, that has done a lot to protect users uh, and to empower them. And they are dealing with clear abuses. You already have some stories that are coming out, so it's, this is working well. Um, I, th I would like to suggest, sorry if I'm taking too much time, um, an alternative to that would be to treat data as a common good. You have some open data initiatives um, that are facilitating access to public sector information and that would greatly improve health, transport, and uh, you know, the environment, and education. Um, and I think you know, the European Commission has been doing some work in that direction, by the way. So my point basically is, you would not make the digital society better, you would make my life more difficult, and you would potentially harm the digital economy. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Glenn, I'm sure you will uh, want to respond, but what I propose is to go to a full round of comments from the panel and then we proceed. Uh, so, um, Lynn, uh, you had the clear points uh, and I will be, I'm looking forward for the discussion on that. Uh, but um, uh, this proposal uh, has many dimensions. And um, having data that it is shared, it is traded, uh, that also has some implications about privacy. I move in alphabetical order of the panel speakers. So I will, uh, I will go to Orla now, who is a privacy expert, and I want to ask her what she thinks about this proposal, if she, this proposal challenges privacy regulation. But also, Glenn mentioned that there are technology ways uh, to have uh, um, to uh, have adequate protection in the, this digital economy. Should this be the way to uh, move forward uh, with less privacy regulation? Thank you. Thanks, Georges. Um, so I guess by, by way of background, I should say that I'm working in the area of data protection regulation. And so I guess when I was, when I was approaching this um, paper, it was uh, with my former research and current research in mind. So in, in previous research, I had looked at the concept of informational self-determination or individual control over personal data in EU data protection law and looked at the potential and then also the limits of that, that idea. And I think like this paper, I had kind of concluded that um, the individual would face this, these kind of cognitive realism issues um, if left entirely alone in order to defend um, and control your data in the current digital um, ecosystem. So this then pushes us to consider more holistic and structural approaches to protect individual personal data in um, the digital system. I think for that and for kind of provoking discussion on this debate, this is, this is a, a fantastic paper and there's much in here that I would agree with. So concerns about economic concentrations of data. So I've done more recent work on intersections of data protection and competition law and the question of data power. So um, the power that stems from data aggregations. And so I think that point um, comes across very clearly here. There are also comments about the lack of sustainability of the current online behavioral advertising model, which I would completely concur with. I think the idea that we need um, intermediaries to help us manage our data, so these MIDs or data unions, is also something I would agree with. I guess perhaps where we would kind of depart in terms of um, future vision 
is on what a dignitary approach to data might entail. And here I have a couple of reservations that probably stem from my own um, background as, as an EU lawyer and considering this within the framework of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and in particular the right to protection of personal data. And so here I think first of all from a practical perspective my two reservations would really be like that the model proposed is individualised and that the model proposed to a certain extent commodifies. And I say individualized here insofar as um, we are asking individuals to uh, provide their data to MIDS who would kind of collectively bargain on their behalf. Yet that initial decision making is all left to the individual. And that is where this model would depart from the current data protection framework. Because of course there are contexts where you consent to your personal data being processed, but the current data protection framework also recognises that in some instances we will process data, for example, in the public interest. So that might be in the context of something like medical data, where irrespective of um, individual wishes, or tax data is probably a better example, uh, irrespective of individual wishes, tax authorities will process your personal data in order to, to come to societal interest. So I guess one concern, a query I had that, you know, it's entirely possible Glenn has already considered, is how this individualised model through MIDS would then um, match and allow for a data commons that would provide for those kind of societal benefits. So that's one query. The next query then relates to the commodification of data. And I understand here that we're not talking about data as property, we're talking about data as labor, and I think that's an interesting distinction that I definitely need to, to think about further. But in some ways, the, com the, the labor model also seems to replicate some of the shortfalls of a property-based model. And that is, I think, that in contrast to principles like data minimization, you are encouraging the, the production of more data, particularly for those who are cash strapped. <laughs> You're also encouraging them to, to hand over sensitive data because that data may be of more value. You're encouraging them to, to ensure the quality of that data, which kind of goes against some of the, the more radical models that we're seeing now where you see data dirtying, um, do not track, all of these, these other models being used by individuals. So I'm wondering whether the model that's proposed is actually hitting, um, hitting the target problem in this area. I'll com come back to that. But I also would, in this sense, concur with Aline that one potential issue here is that, those, that this could exacerbate existing societal inequalities by meaning that those who can afford data protection or privacy will be in a position to withhold and those who cannot would not. And that's in some ways stated in, in the paper where it says, you know, a young person who is starting out and wishes to self-promote might set the price of their data at a lower level. Well, what does that mean for those who are already systemically, economically disadvantaged in this, in this type of framework? So I guess they're my, my two main reservations. Um, but I guess my other query would be to what extent already if we took the EU framework, and I completely appreciate that this is not the case in the US, and that's you know, perhaps where this alternative has most value, therefore. But in the EU framework, we could already achieve some of these um, benefits from moving to this model through our existing legislative framework. And here I would just point to a couple of developments um, at EU level. So first of all, if you look at the increased substantive protection provided to data through the General Data Protection Regulation, one thing to watch here, I think, is something like Article 7.4 of the GDPR, which provides that you um, ordinarily should not be excluded from a platform or from any digital content or service by not providing consent to unnecessary data processing. And I really think that that provision could be pushed on in order to challenge the entire online behavioral advertising model, which in itself as a, as a system arguably relies on excessive data processing with all of the knock-on consequences that entails um, in an unnecessary way. And you might say, well, here data is the quid pro quo for a free service. Well, to that I would counteract the digital platforms could make less money through contextual advertising, but still profit. So I think we need to, in our minds, disassociate the idea that effective data protection means the end of free online content and services. I think there are alternative mechanisms around that. The second development, I think, is that at EU level, you already see in the GDP or mechanisms for this type of collective action. And this is where I think data unions could in fact slot in to the, to the GDP or in a lot of the, 
the MIDs mentioned here, like my data, are already kind of fitting within the data protection framework in this way. So here you could point to something like the ability under the GDPR for an individual to assign their rights to a representative organisation to, to exercise them on their behalf. So maybe we don't even kind of need to introduce the monetization dimension in order to have these collective benefits. And then I think a third development outside of the data protection framework and something I've been working on for the past few years is um, the potential use of competition law to um, break up these economic concentrations um, in digital platforms. And um, here I think there are a few ways to, to view this. Um, where my research is focused is on um, questions of data acquisition or artificial data aggregation through mergers and acquisitions. So here I think, for instance, if you had um, more effective scrutiny of mergers Obvious ones that come to mind would be Facebook, WhatsApp, Microsoft, LinkedIn, and, and various others um, with two different kind of lenses. One is view, with viewing data protection as an element of product quality that could be decreased post-merger. And that's something that was recognized as potentially feasible by the European Commission in the Microsoft LinkedIn merger. But the other is also to think of um, data-driven mergers in the same way that we might think of media mergers. So the types of acquisitions that don't simply require a competition or an economic assessment, but the types of acquisitions that have strategic societal implications beyond the economic and that therefore might merit um, oversight by another body. And uh, so if you're interested in that, there's a recent symposium edition of international data privacy law on this entire topic, which is open access. And that seems to be getting um, civil society organizations themselves are, I think, increasingly interested in this um, topic. The FTC is running its um, competition and consumer protection in a digital era series where they're discussing the, the, these matters. And so that could be another way to introduce um, a, a more structural check on um, data concentrations and on these uh, concentrations of power in the digital environment in a way that might therefore trickle down and lead to, for instance, in, in the area I'm, I'm interested in, more effective data protection for individuals. So I really appreciate the radical ideas that are, that are set out in, in the paper and indeed the book. Um, it's just a query of whether or not you would even need to go that far in the European context in order to get some of the benefits from um, the MIDs. Thank you, Orla, and thank you for respecting the time frame. Um, moving quickly to Bertin, as an expert of uh, uh, data economy, to hear his views on the paper, on, on the idea. Thank you, Jorgos. Um, first of all, I should say that I very much enjoyed reading your book, Glenn, uh, Radical Markets, and I can warmly recommend it to all of you. I had it on my summer holiday reading list and was worthwhile reading. So, uh, very interesting book. Uh, now, Coming to the subject uh, that we are discussing here on data as uh, labor, um, a couple of points that I wanted to make. Um, you, you make this sharp distinction between data as capital, data as labor. I see a lot of gray area in between that, and, and, and I would like to go a little bit deeper into that gray area. Um, I think one of the underlying issues, and, and this is not the first data debate in which I participate, there have been lots of them over the last couple of years and there will no doubt be many more over the next years, is that we don't have any data ownership law, neither in the EU nor anywhere else in the world as far as I know. And the consequence of, well, we have the GDPR, but that does not give us ownership on our data. It gives us some rights to access the data, to consent, to transfer the data, but no tradable ownership right. And when the European Commission introduced a new directive proposal for the supply of digital content online, where it proposed to recognize this barter trade between my data and a service that I get in return, the European Data Protection Supervisor pointed a finger at the Commission and saying, hey, you're moving too closely in the direction of tradable personal data, and that is not right. But the fact of the matter is that we do trade our data online every day on a very large scale. And here I, I have to somewhat agree with uh, Eileen uh, on this point that there is increasing empirical evidence that the value that we get in return for our data is orders of magnitude higher than the market value of our individual personal owned data. 
So we are happy to trade our search terms in Google Search, for example, against the information that we obtain through the search engine, because that information is, in most cases, much more valuable to us than giving away our data. But this brings me to a second point, uh, and, and here I, I, I divert from what Jorgos said in his uh, original comments, where he said, well, there are declining returns to scale. I think there are increasing returns to scale, and here I agree with Glenn, uh, but I see this as economies of scope in data. Merging small data sets into a larger pool of data gives much more value, much more insight that can be extracted from these data. And so the value of the merged pool is much higher than the value of the separate underlying data sets. Uh, but the problem with these increasing returns is um, you cannot exhaust the marginal product of each individual con contribution. With increasing returns, there is a pool of value that remains unassigned to the production factors. And this is, I think, where the dispute today is over who owns the data and who has the right to access the surplus value of the data. Um, uh, to, in, in many ways, it reminds me of, of, a, of a debate that people had centuries ago on the private, privatization of the commons. Uh, there is this common data pool, and there are some big farmers harvesting the data in that commons pool, and for the small farmers, the individuals, there's hardly any value left. Um, and the question is, how, how can we come to a fair distribution of that value? And in that sense, I think Glenn's proposal, so very welcome, is thinking on this. Um, now, can we solve this by creating an intermediary organization that is a sort of a fiduciary trust organization in between the data labor of the individual and, and the big platforms and, and the big companies that want to use these data to feed into their algorithms and so on? In, in many ways, this experiment uh, has been tried already in, 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 in a number of instances. We, we have these so-called uh, uh, personal information management spaces in various forms that have emerged over the last at least 10, 15 years, uh, and there are many examples of them. They have one characteristic in common. They remain very small. They don't scale up. They don't become important in the data market. And why is that? This is, I think, partially for a reason that uh, Eileen already mentioned, is transaction costs are so high for individuals to manage their personal data. I do not even bother to read the consent notice. Even if I would be a lawyer, I would hardly understand what's in it anyway, so why spend my time on it? I just click yes, consent, just give me the information that I want from your website. And similar things with the CAPTCHAs. Uh, I just fill in the CAPTCHA in order to get access to that information. That's for me the least time-consuming, least transaction cost-intensive way of getting there. So uh, I think one of the basic problems is that the, pers the value of personal data, of individual data sets, is so marginal, so low, even if we would have personal ownership rights on the data, if that would be recognized in law, and if we could sell those data, they would fetch a price that's hardly worth it. Uh, and that's why we traded in so easily for, uh, for these online services. Now, if you create, would create such an intermediary platform, apart from transaction costs, there's the other question in a platform, in a multi-sided market is, which site is going to pay for that, for that service that is being offered by this platform? At the moment, you go to Google search or Facebook, the advertisers pay for it. Uh, and they finance the platform. Um, you, can, you can say, okay, I want other sides of the market to finance this and to more of that surplus from advertising revenue to go to the people who contributed the data. But how can you do that? Is it sufficient to have bargaining power as a trade union, as a data trade union, and say, I want part of that value cake? How are you going to do that? Uh, the platforms that have tried this as far as I can see, so far I've failed uh, to scale up uh, for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, so, I, I, uh, as much as I'm sympathetic to the idea that there is a lot of surplus value that is being appropriated by big platforms because they can do so for technological reasons and because there is no data ownership right, even if we would have that data ownership, I do not see how that situation would change very much 
And, and so I, I have problems seeing how that would work in a realistic way. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Bertin. I'm sure there are many points uh, that you want to comment, uh, Glenn, but before that, uh, let me go to Thibault. Uh, Thibault, uh, you work uh, on a body that uh, represents uh, millions of workers. Uh, you are also an expert in AI, in the AI group, uh, which makes you the person to tackle technology uh, questions related uh, uh, to these issues. Your thoughts? Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Um, I'm only a trade unionist, huh? so as you said, I, um, I represent the European Trade Union Confederation. Um, and my entry point in this topic was and is still the situation of workers. So that's my uh, first exp exp expertise. Then I retrain and upskill myself looking at the social dimension of digital trans transformation on data economy, uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Uh, but don't expect me to give you the miraculous answer on uh, how to create a, a data union. Or I will give you some thoughts about uh, your refreshing presentation and, and, uh, and um, theory, I would say, uh, on this. Um, because, first of all, there is um, a challenge that is... Um, posed in your presentation, and that is right. It's about the way that economy, uh, digital economy um, can naturally go uh, towards uh, or feed the winners takes all phenomena, and uh, monopolies and monopsonies as well. Uh, with, and monopsonies is maybe the, the biggest danger with players not being, with uh, companies not being players on the market, but by being the market themselves and defining rules, uh, for example, Amazon, that sells product, uh, but also is the gateway for many small companies uh, that sells products. And there is a data, an issue on data ownership, uh, where here we are not talking about workers, but there are un possible unfair practices on which the, inv the commission investigates, and where uh, Amazon possibly used the data it has on uh, small and medium businesses uh, to adapt their own, its own offer in terms of a uh, product. Uh, so that's, that is to say that there is, in our views, uh, a more general um, challenge uh, in terms of bargaining power in the digital economy, not only linked to workers, not only linked to the data, uh, but also linked to the economic players, uh, economic units, whether they are companies, workers or individuals. And what we see more and more is also uh, that uh, more and more <coughs> individuals uh, providing services or their workforce under commercial law, the, the self-employed and the freelancers, are also facing uh, uh, unfair practices. And, uh, and here, competition rules are challenged as well uh, if we think about what uh, uh, commission, uh, Commissioner Vestager recognized as a as a challenge for um, some self-employed uh, in terms of um, bargaining power. And again, uh, this is linked to, um, to other kind of uh, economic units, let's say, like medias. For example, in the US some years ago, they, they created a kind of an association um, to, ask for the, to ask the Congress for kind of derogation to the antitrust law in the US to be able to bargain with the platforms uh, on the way they are using their content. So their data, by the way, but their content to which are, uh, in that case, uh, articles. So indeed, there is a, an overall bargaining power issue uh, when we talk about the, the um, digital economy. Now, coming back a bit more on the data itself. Um, on data and, and AI, but uh, if we talk first about data, there are, in, in my opinion, necessary s steps that should be taken before, which are, first of all, creating a data culture in the, in the society, in the economy. Uh, first of all, on how data are processed, uh, how to use, how our data is processed, are processed, and they are used on data protection, on even just 
make people citizen aware of the different uh, of the GDPR, for example, of the the challenge of uh, of data in general, but also on how to look at the opportunities of uh, of better um, processing, collecting, aggregating data in the society, and not only for companies, but also. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, uh, for the public goods in general, for public services, but also for uh, civil society organization. Uh, and this is a strong challenge we are looking at uh, in the high level group on AI, uh, in terms of information and skills, and how to make sure we create this data culture that make people aware of, uh, of that raise awareness in being a digital citizen, uh, that is aware of the risks uh, in terms of uh, uh, data processing, but also of the opportunities uh, on the way we can better uh, process our data to, for the public uh, good. Um, but now about the value of data. Uh, we had this reflection, this internal reflection, when a few months ago, uh, the European ministers of finance were, start, were discussing this, uh, this idea of a digital tax. And our entry point was a basic one for our trade union that was, okay, if we tax it, it means that it is a value, and that if, if data is productive, then it means that we should get a compensation, like a wage, you know? I mean, you offer your labor force, you get a wage uh, for this. This was a classical trade union entry point in this. And indeed, uh, we had a long, talks, and I agree with many things that were said, but first of all, um, the issue of selling data and, and possibly entering into a vicious cycle that will encourage people to give more and more data, and, and, and in particular, more disadvantaged people is something that could be, that, that, that uh, uh, and makes us enter into the, the territory of uh, human rights, first of all. But also, I mean, individual data, those who are processed, huh? I mean, not data as uh, profiling someone, but our small data that are processed, it's a it's few cents a, a year. So, um, okay, creating that kind of unions to, for bargaining a few, few cents or one euro, euro a year for all the data that are processed is not necessarily, necessarily the right angle. Maybe the right entry point is, is more uh, the classical good old corporate tax base and corporate tax, and this is the issue on the, on the digital tax. It is about where is the value created and how we tax it for the public good and to finance also social protection, I mean, our uh, public systems. And, uh, and, uh, and here, this requires a kind of a change of paradigm in the way we calculate how, uh, I mean, the value created and data and digital data is also a value, is also an asset. And, and this, um, this idea of a digital tax is, is maybe a more appropriate way to recuperate the value that, what, that is created by, the, by uh, digital companies and to re-inject it uh, into uh, the society in general, not only into the public administration, but into the society in general. Also, this is not only about money, but I agree that our ownership of the data is, in, is important in the way we could decide on what we want uh, this data uh, be useful for. I, I, let me explain this. Um, Basically, data can be an added value in our society, also in the companies, if it helps decision making. So let's use data for what is, it is worth using it, means in increasing the capacity of humans to make decisions. And what I see as a trade unionist is possible opportunities to increase our capacity to make better decisions on our well-being, on uh, social situation, on wealth re uh, redistribution, on climate change, on energy savings, on energy and raw materials. This is where, I mean, we should be more aware as citizens on the data we can produce, and maybe about the ownership, create citizens' own organizations, unions, or maybe more associations, is maybe uh, could maybe be a right answer to find new collective places where we decide how, wh why we give additional data on our practices 
the way we consume, for example, or the way we work, to also decide where this data will be used and how this data will be processed. A bit like uh, how uh, when you invest, you have money, you invest in some uh, uh, funds, you know, um, where uh, your banker will invest, will, will explain you where it, he will invest your money. Here, it's about providing data without necessarily being um, compensated by, uh, by money, but being compensated by a better life, uh, if I could say so. So the interest I see is that data are only interesting if, they are, um, uh, if there is a big amount of data, so if there are collective data. And if it leads, at the end, to collective citizens' reflections on the way uh, data uh, is owned and on the way data is used, that's a good point. Whether unions should do it, I have to say that we have good old challenges to tackle uh, in our economy today and even in the future. I'm not sure whether we will be able to play that role because if you look at the social situation in Europe, if you look at the challenges in terms of upskilling, reskilling people, uh, 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 um, and the good old classical challenges of making sure that end meets between uh, transitions, uh, also climate change transition, and uh, the transformation of, of jobs. I mean, on this, we have a lot of work to do to make sure we renew ourselves. But uh, working with new kind of organization that will look at this and possibly ensure uh, um, uh, a useful collective use of data is something we, we will be ready to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Thibault. So, Glenn, I'm coming back to you with the kind request uh, to be quick in your responses in order to have time for questions. I know that it is very challenging. We heard uh, critical comments, uh, other ideas, other proposals. The floor is yours. Um, I'll try to be brief uh, and primarily address myself to what I think are two broad misconceptions uh, rather than trying to go point by point. So the first is that I think there's a very static vision and actually an internally inconsistent vision uh, among many of the things that were said about data value. On the one hand, everyone wants to say, oh, the digital economy is creating this huge amount of value. It's absorbing, I don't know, a quarter of our time every day on average. It's like becoming our whole lives. There's all this value going around and everyone's getting all this great stuff from it. But there's no value being created. There's no money. There's, there, there's nothing to distribute, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, and, and then somehow people are going to be displaced from all these jobs and there's all these challenges that people are facing and automation is coming, being created by all these data, but somehow the data is not creating any value. So I think that there's something like fundamentally incoherent about that. Um, and I think that the incoherence comes from the fact that we've created an economy where all of the price signals have been taken out. All of the value has been absorbed and just sort of hidden deliberately in the interests of certain people. And then they can say, oh, well, there's just a few pennies floating around. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I think that that is a fundamental paradox. And I think it's a huge mistake to fall into that. And in fact, there are lots of examples in history of precisely this thing happening. Consider the way that women's work was treated forever. Women's work was treated as Oh, but what are you going to do? You're going to make the men share the wage? The men have to share their wage with their wife? You're just going to take whatever the men are producing and you're just going to give? How, how is that going to help any families? You know, you're just going to split it in half. You know, and, 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 and there's no good to that, right? And, and then, oh, and, and, and like, think of how hard it would be to women. They have to now go and work in the workplace. You know, they, they can't just have the easy life that they have at home where they don't have to worry about the complexities of the workplace. I mean, think of all the transaction costs associated with that. Um, and, and think of all the transaction costs, by the way, for the serve. They now have to figure out, they have to go to the city, they've got to find a job, they've got to choose a job. They don't just have this you know, easy life where things are clearly provided. Think of all the services that they're getting. For, so so there's, this, there's this like real incoherence that I think comes out of not recognizing that actually giving people agency and like valuing things in a marketplace and assigning value to things actually creates like way more dynamic economies. And when you let women go out into the workplace, like then there's actually domestic work that people can do and be compensated for. And the women who stay at home anyway, they get valued for it and, and they have a better social position in exchange because you actually take into account uh, the value that they're creating. Um, the second point 
which really is not mostly an economic point, it's mostly a social point, is I think that there is a fundamental problem in our language created by the digital economy that many of the folks here fall into, where there is the individual and then there is the collective. But what the heck is the collective? Like when you talk about common goods, do you mean common goods for the whole world? Do you mean common goods for a country? Why the nation state in particular? I mean, the, the, a rich, diverse society does not have the isolated individual and the state or the platform or whatever. It has a diverse range of different organizations which check and balance and create complexity. And the, the problem I have with a lot of what was said was saying, oh, we're gonna treat it as a common good. What on earth does that mean? That means Google controls all of it, that's great for us. That means the state controls all of it. What if you know Donald Trump gets elected and is in control of the state? I, it seems to me that it's incredibly important that we have different organizations with genuine economic, social, and psychological power over this stuff if we want to have a robust and, and survivable society. So uh, anyways, I, I'd love to take some questions, but, but those are philosophically where I think I differ from a lot of the speakers. Sorry, very briefly, I think you misunderstood as well, maybe from other speakers, but uh, uh, to have some organization, not, be, I mean, having in, in organization between the individual and the entire world is precisely uh, what I'm calling for. Uh, and we need, whether there are unions and whether data should be seen as, a, as money is what I'm not convinced about. But uh, seen as a value for the public good, but whether it is from an, or for an organization. For example, for, again, yeah. for example uh, looking at a trade union, if tomorrow uh, a trade union better manage uh, um, and process uh, data, uh, not on profiling in the member, for example, but on data, uh, a data a trade union has on the different companies where the members are in terms of economy, um, wages, uh, uh, I don't know, different criteria, then it will increase uh, his knowledge about uh, the situation on the labor market. That's a way to increase and to improve decision making and also to improve uh, the way a, a trade union as a social organization will make decisions and then will go into a negotiati negotiating employment policies, uh, working time, wages. That's what I'm talking about. It's just to say that, of course, that we need a, a civil society organization and, and, and organization, not only the individual and the entire world, the American citizen and Donald Trump. There are things behind. Yeah. Uh, and that data is not only money. Data is another kind of value. I, I think we should go to questions just to open it to the floor. But. Uh, let's have some questions, uh, two, three, and we answer collectively. So, yes, Scott. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank Glenn and all of the panelists for a really, really fascinating exchange. Uh, I had uh, one, actually, especially to Barton Martins, and also I'm sure Glenn will have views on this. Uh, I, I think that this perception of, uh, of uh, data in, in the context of a two-sided or multi-sided market, I think, is, is spot on. And, of course, there, the, the value of data normally, uh, essentially, the, the way that you were saying who pays, normally in a multi-sided market, uh, a, a platform determines this uh, based on externalities on both sides and especially on price elasticity of demand and maybe uh, transaction costs as well. So it, it seemed to me that one area <coughs> where, um, where this notion of uh, intermediaries would have particular promise is something that you and I had talked about shortly before the session today, which is some of the new emerging markets like uh, automotive, smart cars, or, or also, for example, harvesters, where the consumer isn't part of the game at all. The farmer who's harvesting the field doesn't get access to the data that the harvester is making. Um, and uh, likewise with the smart car, the data probably is not going to the consumer, it's going to the manufacturer. So would you see the intermediary in a case like that where, where the consumer is really fully cut out of the loop uh, as having a special value? Thank you. Other questions? I should have introduced myself, Scott Marcus Bruegel. Yes. Please. Hello, Anselm Rodenhausen from the European Commission from DG Connect. I'm with a unit dealing with the digital single market strategy and development. 
but I've only been there for a while before I was for many years a competition lawyer here in Brussels working for the big network operators until I heard the good, the call for the good side of the force. So, <laughs> but jokes aside, I think it helps to see the issue or the issue of market concentration in the data markets from both sides. And this is why, if you allow, I have two questions. One legal question, another a bit more techy. Uh, the legal one, maybe for Orla, is what might be the right legal regulatory instruments to tackle these issues? Is it really an ex post instrument such as competition law or now the GDPR also providing the opportunity for high fines, but this is all ex post regulation? Or is it rather maybe ex ante, such as we have under Article 7 in the telco uh, um, sector? Both types of regulation have pros and cons. While uh, ex post might be quite flexible, um, it might come in situations where you already have a problem. On the other hand, uh, ex ante starts very early, but you have a problem or a potential risk of overregulation and so on. And very interesting to, to see what you think might be best fit or maybe a mix of these types. Or might be another solution to this issue, not regulation, but technology itself. And that maybe is a question for Glenn. Uh, sorry, I came too late, so I missed your presentation, but I saw your, uh, saw your presentation at the Microsoft event um, uh, a month ago. And I thought some of the ideas you had then reminded a bit, me a bit of these blockchain blockchain enthusiasts and their idea of that blockchain might be a technology which might do a couple of wonderful things, among others that it might give control of data back to the individual. And so my question is, could it be that technology, whether it's blockchain or something else, like a decentralized ledger technology, might be the solution to the issue of having high concentration, to having all these platforms controlling the data. Maybe it's not only regulation, but also techno technological development who might bring us a step closer to the solution. Thank you. Any final question? Yes. Very quick one. Enrico Bergamini from Bruegel. Um, I didn't really get what's your uh, view on the opt-in mechanism, right? So if you talk about a union uh, or if you talk about a, an insurance, uh, there are very different ways uh, in which uh, this system is based on opt-in. Opt in. And I don't really see if it's a union, what's, uh, what, we live in a world where you, know, you have Facebook in which uh, sort of like for this chain of production in which the, the workers are really happy to give away uh, what they have in return for uh, what is en engineered as a uh, chemical return uh, psychologically, right? Uh, they're hiring uh, cognitive psychologists, and you touched upon that, and I totally share your, your concerns over that. Uh, but what would be the opt-in mechanism in that sense? Why would people uh, care about that? Could we get one question from a woman before we close? Is anyone interested in? Yeah. yeah. I'm, my name is Mika and I'm working at a Belgian permanent representation. We are also reflecting a lot on how the future and how the Commission should in the future uh, tackle uh, data ownership and data access. Um, I wanted to know from you whether you're familiar with the initiative that Finland now put forward, the My Data um, initiative, um, or maybe Orla is. Um, and, um, well, it's basically a new approach on how consumers or how citizens can uh, manage their data and get control over their data in line with GDPR, but also uh, give leeway to businesses and, um, and, and companies to develop AI and, and to develop machine learning, uh, piling, of course, all the data together. Um, and I see the, the person from the commission nodding. So I, this, is, this might be a, also answering to um, the model you are ca calling for. Thanks. So, who prefers to start? Uh, Glenn. Glenn, please. Well, I'll try to go very briefly through the various things. So, first of all, I think that the question of instances when companies um, control data, but that's relevant to individuals, is extremely important. Um, 
I think that this is one of the most important labor issues of the future, and I think it's something that even, quote, traditional unions need to be really, really thinking about because there are things built into employment contracts right now that are effectively granting all the data rights over to companies and that the unions aren't even thinking about that being an issue. And it's actually going to be critical to the future of your, yeah. Because I think this is incredibly, incredibly important because basically what's going to happen is the companies are going to use these data to train productivity AI and maybe the companies will get some of the value. Probably the platforms will get all the value. But maybe the companies can bargain for some value. And then the worker is going to get completely cut out of the loop even though they did all the work and, the, and they weren't in many cases even aware that that data was then going to be used to train things that would displace them from jobs. So I think that's hugely important. On the blockchain question, um, blockchain is a very interesting movement and it's a movement I'm very sympathetic to. To call it a technology that solves these type of problems, I think misunderstands what blockchain can actually do. The truth is that blockchain is a public ledger technology. It is not really very useful for anything private. Um, I think what's quite interesting is the solid project that Tim Berners-Lee is doing. Um, but ultimately, I think that even that is too individualistic um, because individuals shouldn't be the ones controlling their data. It should be some form of collective organization. So I've been thinking about architectures around what I call social identity, where data are sort of mirrored across many people's private servers without them being stored globally that I think have a lot more promise to address this. But again, I think calling it technology is really misleading. Like fundamentally, all these things are social infrastructures. And there's like a back and forth between the technological and the social. Opt-in mechanism, I think there has to be some amount of what, as unions have, where you can vote to be collectively represented by something rather than just individually opting in. I think that's too individualistic. And I didn't know much about the Finland architecture. I'm interested to learn about it. So thanks. Who wants uh, from the panel to continue? Just very quickly to say, that, yeah, I'm aware of this Finnish initiative, and for me this falls in the category of what I call personal information management platforms, and there have been dozens of examples over the last decade or longer, and as I said, none of them has scaled up so far, so I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen to this Finnish initiative, but I see very few people willing, very few people willing to spend time actually on managing their data. If, as Glenn suggests, this would be a collective thing and not an individual thing, maybe that would reduce the cost for individuals. Uh, but somebody else is going to decide in our place then. Maybe, yeah. If a technology can be designed that makes it much more interesting for individuals to indeed go to such platforms and manage their spaces to that, manage their data to that, that might become in the future an attractive proposition. But I haven't seen that sort of technology yet emerging. Uh, another thing I wanted to add is that uh, I think in this debate we have focused far too much, especially in our debate as panel, on business to consumer data. There's a lot more to be said on business to business yeah. data, uh, and I understand that uh, for companies that are more in that domain, that there is value in, in remunerating data labor much more in order to attract and incentivize that labor and to, to get more efficiency in the production of that labor. I think lots of companies are trying that already in many different ways. Uh, but yeah, there's still this problem of how to allocate this surplus value of the data merged pool and the, and the data pool. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, Ola, any comment on the legal question? Yeah, sure. So um, just on the question of uh, what would be preferable, pre preferable uh, ex ante or ex post uh, measures, well, I think here one of the issues is if we say one of the, the problem is economic concentration or platform power, the, the, the harms, the potential harms that stem from that are, are numerous and varied. So Glenn touches on them in the paper, but it's it, their labor issues, it's different disinformation, their data protection issues, um, their questions of content regulation, for instance. So I don't think any form of single ex ante measure would deal with all of those distinct um, issues, and that's maybe what's quite ambitious about this proposed framework. So then I think if you look to what exists ex post, um, here I think it could be linked to the question of my data, just that 
there is the potential already in the GDPR to enable individuals to exercise this control potentially through intermediaries. And I know PIMS haven't, or these personal information management systems haven't been able to scale up, but in, in the public sector context, that can be particularly interesting if you think of something like health data, because people are generally quite receptive to having their health data used for beneficial purposes. Um, but, you know, colleagues at the LSE have been designing platforms that would allow for that kind of more general, granular control in, in that context, for instance. Uh, the question is then whether or not simply applying the existing legal framework. I, I have a lot of hope that actual enforcement of the GDPR will allow us to get that balance between the, the public interest in processing this data and the potential benefits that can flow from that and individual control. If, if we give it a bit of time, it's only been enforced since May. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time. Any comment from this, quick comment from this table, side of the table? Very short one. Um, uh, about the, 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 the last one about um, the data, what, what you have said. I mean, the thing is that the, the, the problem, the challenge you address is really, a, a, a really an important one. Um, the issue of um, who has the data and who process the data is the real one. Whether we just let the platforms process our data and we bargain with them the fair share of the, the, the value created by the data is maybe not the only one. Because uh, tomorrow, if you want to use data for public good, it's not only by letting Google do it with AI for good and having a monopoly on make it good in the entire world on the, our data, but it's also to make sure that there are different players, including public one or citizens' own initiative, that collect and process data and use them uh, for, for different purposes. So it's not only about letting the platform go and getting a fair share of it. It's a bit more structural than well, this. Well, but the thing is, I, I very explicitly did not say that, right? I said specifically that the data would be inalienably held by your mid. And the goal was precisely to diversify the set of players. So that, 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 that's the central idea of the proposal, is, is exactly that it is not held by. It's only API accessed by the platforms. Any final word, Aline? Just uh, very quickly. Um, well, for me, it's, uh, there's one thing that really I thought was striking is um, how complex the argument is, because just uh, looking at the EU, we are 27, 28 countries. Um, with different perspectives, with different, we, we have a different way to value privacy and data. And that's just in Europe. So that's just really something that I thought was just complex as an individual to, so I wanted to just, I hope I can hear your, your thoughts on that afterwards. Unless there is uh, no any other comment, uh, Glenn, do you want to add something? Okay. So we are out of time. Uh, let me uh, please join me in uh, thanking the speakers to be uh, to be with us. Uh, radical ideas require uh, creative discussion, and I'm very happy to have the panelists today. Have a nice evening.